All right, let's do this one last time. Welcome back, everyone. This will be my brand new Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse trailer video. They shot off a bunch of new scenes, so we'll break it down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. There's still a lot of really big Spider-Man stuff coming up, even though we just got Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man back during Spider-Man No Way Home. So wait, are you going to go into battle dressed as a cool youth pastor, or you got your suit? And quick reminder, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is a two-part movie. That's right, they're doing the Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame thing where they split the movie into two different parts. We're getting part one next year and part two the year after that, so there will be a giant wait for part two of the movie. One of the key differences between this movie and the first Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse movie is the first movie was all about other characters coming to Miles Morales' universe, the ultimate Spider-Man universe. The sequels is going to be the opposite. It'll be him going to other universes inside the Spider-Verse. I've already done a trailer video that they dropped earlier this year, so I'll link it at the end of this too. But if it wasn't clear from that, when they travel to other universes, they use different animation styles for each different version of Spider-Man's universe. So for example, in the trailer, there's a lot of footage of Miles Morales traveling to this alternate universe of Spider-Man India's universe. He's a Hindu Spider-Man, so everything's drawn in an Indian-themed animation style for that country. The same is true when he goes to Spider-Man 2099's universe in Nueva York in the future. I'll also explain that too, like how can he travel in time when he's traveling between universes? But the first brand new scene that they showed off was of Spider-Gwen. It started with a new scene of Gwen Stacy's Spider-Gwen, voiced by Haley Steinfeld, who actually just showed up in the Hawkeye series in the live-action MCU universe as a version of Kate Bishop. She'll be part of the Young Avengers, but if you want to, you could think of her as a variant of Kate Bishop in the MCU. They were going to have cameos with Tom Holland's live-action Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire, and Andrew Garfield, like they did in Spider-Man No Way Home. But at the time, a couple years ago, when they were developing that first movie, remember, this is a couple years ago, Sony said that that was way too meta, way too weird to mix in live action elements and try to say that all these universes are connected. Cut to now, when we just had Spider-Man No Way Home and Doctor Strange 2 Multiverse of Madness, and things have gotten pretty weird. So I think it's pretty safe to say that it's okay to do that now. But Gwen Stacy's Spider-Gwen's Earth is on Earth-65 within this Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse multiverse. It was drawn in the same style when we saw her universe while she was narrating her backstory during the first movie. With the visual dials cranked up to 11, it looked way more beautiful than like the normal Ultimate Spider-Man Miles Morales universe. Everything is drawn in watercolors, layered brush strokes, paper textures. It's meant to look very beautiful compared to the normal universe that you would think of in Ultimate Spider-Man's universe. In the clip, you see Gwen Stacy's dad, George Stacy, voiced by Shea Winningham. That was actually a big reveal, too, that he's voicing the character, who's meant to be a by-the-books cop in the movie, responding to a disturbance at the Guggenheim Museum. Because Spider-Gwen is trying to be a superhero, she beats him there and tries to solve the crime before he shows up. And when she shows up at the Guggenheim Museum, she meets a bunch of the other variants of Spider-Man from other universes. She meets Spider-Man 2099, voiced by Oscar Isaac, who's also Moon Knight in the live-action MCU universe that we just saw. A version of Jessica Drew, Spider-Woman, from another universe, voiced by Issa Rae. Remember, both of their universes would be completely different looking from Spider-Gwen's universe and from Ultimate Spider-Man Miles Morales' universe. And she also winds up meeting a version of the Vulture, voiced by Yorma Tacone, who actually voiced the Green Goblin in the first movie. So, like, he's back voicing a completely different character. So another big reveal was that a version of Vulture would be in the movie. But just like all the characters that you see in the first Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse movie, they're all a little bit different than what you've seen in the live-action Spider-Man movies before. So he's very different from, say, like Michael Keaton's version of the Vulture. And one of the funny things that they did with Jessica Drew's Spider-Woman in the movie is that they made her super pregnant like she is in her comic book. Like she's still meant to be a badass, but she's got this giant pregnant belly for most of the movie. So part of the comedy is her swinging around, beating the crap out of all of these villains while she's super pregnant. Then they clarified a little bit about what's going on with Spider-Man 2099 in the context of this animated multiverse. During the movie, they explained that Miguel O'Hara isn't supposed to have regular Spider-Man powers. He wasn't bitten by a radioactive bug the same way that Ultimate Spider-Man was. In the movie, just like the comics, he actually does a gene splicing treatment and gives himself arachnid-like powers. So he doesn't wind up getting the Spidey sense, but he does have some Spider-Man-based powers. Like he has super strength, he can climb walls. And because he's from the future, a lot of the advanced tech in the movie, like the webware that allowed them to travel between universes, come from him. One of the cool abilities that he'll have in the movie is also a giant laser web. Then there was a completely different scene of Miles Morales just kind of showing what's going on in his daily life before things go completely off the rails for him. It's been a couple years since the first movie. He's grown up a little bit. He's learning to balance his school life with his home life and his superhero life as the ultimate version of Spider-Man. 
He's got the upgraded version of the suit with the new looking version of the logo. And in the scene, he's not wearing the costume. He's running late for a meeting between him, his parents, and his regular school counselor, just a regular person voiced by Rachel Dratch. Miles is meant to have a ton on his mind, getting into the college of his dreams because he's getting ready to go to college, keeping his city safe as Spider-Man, to being a good son to his parents. So he's just trying to juggle everything all at once. Then while he's on the way to this meeting that he's late for, his spidey sense goes off and he winds up running into the new villain of the film for the first time called The Spot. Even though he might not be the ultimate villain of both of these films because it's a two-part film like Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame essentially, he's voiced by Jason Schwartzman and he's a huge deep cut from the comics. You see both him and Spider-Gwen fighting him in this scene that they release here. Like you see him trying to kick him, but he's using one of the portals on his body, one of his abilities, to cause his leg to come out and kick Spider-Gwen on accident. Spot's whole body is covered in interdimensional portals made to feel like living ink in the movie the way they animated it, and he can send people anywhere he wants them to go, including himself. He can also make portals appear out of thin air away from his body and transport objects and people at will. They said Spot's character design, the way they animated him in the movie, is meant to evoke unfinished sketches with blue construction lines representing the artist's rough outline before work is then sent to be inked. So there's this big easter egg in the way that they animated him. They said that they thought it would be really cool if they used the Spot's portals, making them feel like living ink had spilled and splattered all over a comic artist's drawing. And even though his power is meant to be very simple in concept, it's meant to prevent this really big challenge for Miles Morales. They said the spot's design will change and grow as the movie goes on, representing the character's mastery of his own powers. It's the same thing that happened to Miles Morales during the events of the first film. When Miles first got his powers, they animate him at 12 frames a second to show how kind of jumpy and unsure he is. And then towards the end of the film, as he becomes more sure of himself and learns more about his powers, they start animating his character at 24 frames a second so he looks way more smooth, way more sure of himself. The same thing is true in the sequel. They animate him at a faster frames per second rate so that he seems more smooth, more sure of himself because a couple years have gone by. The Spot's real name is Jonathan Own. He was a college roommate with Quentin Beck Mysterio in college. Originally, he was a scientist working for Kingpin. This is the connection back to the events of the first film. He started out working for Kingpin who tasked him in recreating the cloak's dark force powers. Remember, it's all about using the dark force to teleport. But in an accident, he wound up traveling to an alternate dimension that they just call the Spotted Dimension, full of portals. When he found the portal back to his Earth in return, he found that his entire body had been mutated, covered in the portals. He could generate portals all over his body and transport himself different distances at will. It sounds like in the movie, eventually he will be able to transport himself across universes. His main weakness is that there is a limit to the number of portals that he can throw or generate. Once he begins to hit his limit, his body begins to turn solid white, and that's when he becomes really weak to Spider-Man's attacks, so the trick is just to extend him past his limit. My early theory is that Miles Morales and the others will just defeat him with the help of them all working together, like a multiverse tag team with all the versions of Spider-Man fighting him at the same time, just pushing him past his limit in the amount of portals that he can create. They did confirm that Peter B. Parker's midlife crisis Spider-Man is coming back for the movie. And even though he wasn't in the brand new footage that they just showed off or in the trailer, they confirmed that the 1970s Japanese Spider-Man, Spider-Man, is going to be in the movie. His universe, for example, would be animated in traditional anime style. I've already done a much longer trailer video for the other footage they dropped late last year, so I'll post a link down in the description below. But if you have any questions about what's going on in the movie or what's going on with these two different parts of the movie, just let me know in the comments and I'll try to add those to my bonus videos. We'll get another trailer later this year. The movie's coming out June 2nd, 2023. Speaking of live action Spider-Man stuff though, it is still possible for them to work in cameos for Tom Holland, Tobey Maguire, and Andrew Garfield's live action versions of Spider-Man. And it sounds like it's probably going to wind up being about a three year time gap for Spider-Man 3. So we'll probably hear something about what's going on with that next year. Usually it winds up being about two years before the release date, before they really start making noise about that. Everyone click here for my brand new Thor Love and Thunder trailer video and Easter eggs. And click here for my brand new Marvel Thunderbolts announcement video. That's right, they're doing Thunderbolts. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.